Okay, everybody, we're here. Um, actually, we're here all in our homes during this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And uh, I'm here with uh, retired Navy SEAL Captain John Doolittle, a former swimmer at the Air Force Academy. And uh, he also subsequently did a uh, crossing of the English Channel. And also Chris Morgan, the head swim coach of the Gator Swim Club. Uh, it's, a, it's a large age group swim team uh, located just north of Boston. And Chris is a coach at the Olympics. He's coached several NCAA Division I uh, swimmers. Um, he's trained them, he's prepared them. Um, he was a former assistant coach at uh, Harvard University and Stanford University. But we'll take it over to Chris to introduce himself more uh, uh, fully. And then we'll ask you a bunch of questions, Chris. Go ahead. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Steve, for that introduction. I appreciate those of you that wanted to hear anything I have to say. Um, I don't know if anything I have to say will be interesting, but some people say my my parkour, my story is kind of interesting. Uh, so as Steve said, I'm originally, I'm, I'm sitting right now in, in Danvers, Massachusetts, which is just north of Boston. Um, my I grew up and, and I was born at Stanford University, was raised in that area, uh, I did my undergrad at UC Davis. Um, I thought when I was uh, going into college that I would be a vet. That was sort of the direction I took. So I was really excited to go to, to UC Davis, but I changed directions real quick and spent a few, well, basically I was a swimmer at UC Davis, uh, Division II program. We had a, I always tell people, I wish I could go back and coach the team that I swam with. And that's in no way a, a disrespect or, or a knock on the coaches I had because they were phenomenal. I just realized the talent uh, and probably coaching my own self. I wish I could have coached my own self. I would have been a better swimmer um, from what I've learned over all these years. But uh, after uh, swimming at, at UC Davis, I went back kind of to my roots and, and didn't really know what I was going to do and had applied to grad school at Stanford. Got in and while I was kind of figuring out what I was going to do, started swimming masters. And within a few days of, of swimming, this, that was in 1992. Um, and actually, I had graduated a little bit early. So I, I came down to Stanford and was around during the whole build up to the 92 Olympics in, in Barcelona. And so there was a lot of hype and a, a lot of stuff going on at Stanford. Um, Richard Quick, the women's coach, and Skip Kenny, the men's coach, they were... Um, both heavily involved. They had a lot of fast swimmers, a lot of fast swimmers at, at that time. I mean, I could just ramble off some names and, and people would know, you know, some of those, whether it be J Jeff Rouse, uh, Brian Redder, Derek Weatherford, who weren't all Olympians. Um, Pablo Morales, of course, was on the, the, the tail end of his successful comeback. And then on, on the women's side, I think the name that people remember is Summer Sanders. But I, I, I was very lucky. My whole career, I've sort of come into these lucky spots and what was lucky at at Stanford was Richard kind of Richard Quick took me under his wing and he needed some people coaching uh, with the Stanford swim camp with the master's team um, and even you know back then the NCAA rules were a little lighter we'll say I won't want to get anyone in trouble but th there was probably a little bit more people on pool decks during those times where the NCAA rules weren't as tight and strict as they are now. Um, I sometimes tell people I started as a volunteer, volunteer assistant coach with Richard, which is kind of the truth. Um, and he took me under his wing. And uh, when he went away to Barcelona, I stayed on coaching a little bit with uh, the then associate head coach or assistant coach, a gentleman named Ross Geary, another person, if anyone knows Ross or is connected to Ross, he's probably a big part of why I do this is from what I learned from Ross during the years I was on the pool deck at, at, at Stanford. Uh, fast forward, um, met a woman at Stanford and in 1997, we ended up moving to Switzerland. Uh, kind of, I think it, I, I tell people it was harder the day I told Richard I was moving to Europe than it was to tell my own, my own parents. But we had the thought of going for two years uh, so left um, the woman I, I moved there with, we were, we were not married, but we were living together. She had a job that started at a startup company in Geneva. I, I apologize if this is boring to anyone. 
And um, I had done my undergrad at UC Davis in just biological sciences with a minor, believe it or not. A lot of people don't know this in Native American studies. So that's that's a, for another katsu topic. Uh, but I ended up moving out to Switzerland in uh, the fall of 97. And through some very interesting connections and names that I had, um, actually it was a former swimmer at Stanford, a, a young man named Dodd Wales. His father, Ross Wales, who was also an Olympian in the 70s, uh, he had given me a couple names because he was a vice president of FINA at that time. And I was at least knowledgeable enough to know that Switzerland, uh, that, that Lausanne, Switzerland was where the world headquarters of FINA was. I thought when I go to see the building, it would be this giant monstrosity of a building. It's actually just a two, two room, or at that time, it was just a two room run by a couple of people. And, um, but I had a name of a gentleman named Tony Ulrich, who was back in the eighties, the Swiss national team coach. So I literally had a fax phone number because there was no email then, right? And a, a name and moved to Switzerland with, with a piece of paper. Uh, and after basically a few days of living in Geneva, Switzerland, I went to the local pool in Geneva, in Geneva, a pool called, I apologize if I say it with a French accent, the Piscine de Vernay, and went to the pool and walked out on the pool deck and saw this guy who looked like a coach. Uh, and it turned out it was, um, I'll, I'll, it was funny because he actually cussed me out. Like I, I asked him if he spoke English and he says, he, you know, dropped a few words and said, of course he did. Uh, it turned out that he was, um, his father was a Swiss gentleman and his mother was from Great Britain. So he was fluent in four languages actually. And he then took me under his wing and that was in the, the, the fall of 97. Uh, fast forward 2000, I had started to lead my own swim team in Switzerland, um, but, but was missing, I felt like I was missing something on the education side. So I went back to school and did my master's degree in sports science um, and specifically in human movement. I was always passionate about kooky things, things that were different, things that were outside of the box. Uh, one of my mentors in Switzerland was a, a gentleman named um, uh, Jean-Pierre Egger. He was the strength coach for a lot of famous Swiss athletes. One particular athlete was a world champion shot put thrower. D discus and shot put, or I, I believe it was shot put. Uh, Werner Gunther, he was a, this incredible monstrosity of a human, but was very quick, very agile. And through his strength coach, this Jean-Pierre Egger, I met another swimmer, a gentleman named Stefan Vollery, who worked with, uh, worked with Jean as well. Stefan Vollery was a four-time Olympian for Switzerland. And in fact, in 1988, at the Olympic Games, a little swimming trivia for anyone who you know follows, I've it's kind of some fun trivia is in the 1988 um, Olympics, it was the first Olympics where they hosted the 50 meter freestyle. It had prior to that by FINA had just been considered a, it was at the world championships, 1986 in Madrid, they had the 50 freestyle, but sometime after that FINA, I couldn't give you the exact date, but very, very uh, around the 1986 period is when uh, FINA had, or the, the IOC in, in conjunction with FINA decided that the 50 freestyle would be in the Olympic Games and it was no longer a world best, it was a world record. And this gentleman, Stefan Vollery, was one of the best in the world. And if you go back and look at the swimming results or any swimming history, uh, he was always in, in, in the top. Um, com he competed in four Olympic Games and in 1988, as I said, in Seoul, he was fifth from Switzerland. And the funny thing is, the gentleman who was fourth was another Swiss guy. So the Swiss, you think skiing, you think ice hockey, you think luge, but in 1988, they had two very good swimmers. Now, the reason I'm sharing all this with you is because it, it, it's the reason why Katsu has been something I'm interested in because those, those names I just mentioned were the people that showed me that alternative training can be very, very beneficial. Stefan Vollery, uh, Stephen, he would be a gentleman for us to get on one time to talk. He trained almost his entire career in a weight room and in a 15-meter pool. That was it. 
Now, you might think, oh, Switzerland, he might not have been that fast. Well, he swam 22. It, those of you that know, you know, swimming times, he swam 22.8, 22.7 in the 50-meter freestyle. He was also a 48 uh, short course meters, 100-meter freestyle. So he was a, a world-class swimmer and never, you know, did any kind of long course training. Um, he did a lot of his training, you know, lumberjack style, chopping wood. You know, you think of Rocky Balboa, this was the guy. And so it really, that's what really inspired me to think, wow, there's different ways, you know, to swim fast. Um, I do believe in, in, in swimming as well, though I'm sort of a mix of, of, of all of these people. Uh, so my career really took off around 2000. I started to have some kids make the national team. I was invited into the national team. Stephen, you stop me if I'm going off on any tangents. What, what I'd like to do is, is get to uh, the 2008 Olympics yeah. and then your transfer uh, or your transition to Harvard and then your transition to uh, the Katsu. Right. So um, I did my master's degree in, in sports science. I finished that in 2005. 2005, I was one of the lead national team coaches in Switzerland. And um, in 2008, we had a very successful group. One, one athlete uh, who I was working with, a, a young man named Dominique Maitri, ended up, uh, it, well, he ended up in the prelims of the 200 freestyle qualifying first. Um, and in, in, in Beijing, the prelims were in the evening. And, and of course, the next day, the semifinals were in the morning. So when my athlete qualified first in front of, you know, none other than Michael Phelps, it was a very uh, interesting few hours. A lot of uh, Americans looked at me very like a traitor. And I was, I said, no, this is my athlete. If he wins, he wins. Uh, Dominique ended up going on to be sixth in the final. So it was also a very a very good, uh, a good moment for us. And again, we used a lot of alternative training. Uh, so that, that was kind of the highlight uh, of my period in Switzerland. Um, fast forward a few years later, I ended up, um, uh, the, the woman I had moved to Switzerland with, we had gone our separate ways and I then met my now wife. Uh, we actually met at an airport in the US and after a long distance relationship, I ended up at uh, Harvard University in, in 2012. Um, and that's where I met Stephen. Uh, in fact, should I share that story, Steve? Yes, yes. So I was uh, the assistant coach of the women's team at Harvard. And um, I was just sitting in my office one day on the pool deck at Harvard and had seen three individuals out on the pool deck. There was Coach Tim Murphy, the men's head coach, uh, Alex Meyer, who was at that time a postgrad from Harvard training had already qualified for the 2012 Olympics in the 10K. And this gentleman putting these bands around uh, Alex Meyer's arms. So I said, well, that looks cool. I'm gonna go check it out. So I kind of just walked out and gave them their space. And after watching Alex and Steven remembers this day probably as well, he swam a few laps and he literally stopped on the wall and he ripped the bands off and, 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 and said how, how much pain he had in his arm. And I said, well, that's, that's interesting. I'd like to learn more. So um, I started speaking with Stephen. And, and, and then actually, Steve and I realized we had known each other from years prior when I had been at Stanford um, and, and had actually realized that I had been watching Katsu not only at that moment with Stephen in 2012, but back in the 90s at Stanford, we had an athlete named Misty Hyman who had worked with training with rubber bands, series of, they were almost postal rubber bands, like uh, holding big pieces of mail together. And Misty used to train with those rubber bands. And it turns out, Steve, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm not saying this exactly as it was, but she, her coach had been inspired and had been knowledgeable about Katsu and blood flow moderation training from Japan himself. So they had been experimenting already back in the 90s Fast forward back to 2012, Steve and I started uh, working together and I ended up diving, uh, no pun intended, into Katsu 110%. And the way you dove into Katsu is actually very interesting. You literally dove into a puddle of water. And can you yeah. do that? So I was right. training with Steven and Coach Stephanie Morosky, the head coach, and um, Mr. Shimizu, who is probably one of the most, uh, other than Dr. Sato and Steven, a very knowledgeable uh, Japanese, uh, I would almost call him a sensei, 
he was living, he had moved to Cambridge to, to, to work with us, um, this gentleman. And we had been, you know, I'd been working slowly and, and diligently with him, learning about the physiology of katsu, learning about uh, more about the, which is the important part, is the, uh, I would say, the, um, the protocols. And uh, when you really approach it as most Japanese people would, which is the discipline the understanding, the again, the discipline. I think that that's what really makes a difference. So we were working with it, and I was, you know, becoming quite knowledgeable. And uh, Mr. Shimizu was very strict about the tightness of the bands, the appropriate pressure, the optimal pressure. Uh, so I feel very lucky that I that I did learn from him and Stephen at that time. But uh, I was just approaching forty years old at that time, and. I had sort of a midlife crisis. What am I going to do? I want to do something fun. So I ended up signing up for one of these Tough Mudder events up in Mass in New Hampshire. And I did train a little bit. Um, wasn't yet using Katsu for my training more because I didn't know much about it. I was still just learning the protocols. Uh, I ended up, little, like Steven said, I slipped on mile 10, fell into a mud puddle. And I knew right away, because the only bone I'd ever broken in my life was my rib. So I knew right away I'd broken my rib. And so I kind of, you know, shrugged it off and finished the next two miles with this incredible pain. Um, that was on a Saturday. I ended up going to the, uh, to the emergency room at Mass General, got an x-ray and it turned out my rib. I not only did, I had two broken ribs. One was a full fracture and one was cracked. And anyone who's had a broken rib, I see Dr. Ali here. So I know he knows about broken ribs. Hey. Uh, they're painful. You can't cough, you can't laugh, you can't sneeze. So, and again, I knew, knew it was broken before they told me. Uh, the next mon morning, Monday morning, I had a, a session with, with Mr. Shimizu and I went in basically to tell him I couldn't even lift my arms above. I, I couldn't do any, I was in so much pain. And I said, I can't do katsu. And that's when they said, you must do more katsu. And I said, how so? So that's where I started learning about the katsu cycles. And the importance of literally, I, I call it, I apologize for all the science people out there if I don't have the technical terms, but I, I transformed my physiology. I transformed my, um, the way I heal. And I was literally doing katsu cycles probably five times a day. Um, arms, legs, arms, legs, just trying you know, to see. Um, I, eight days later, I ended up going to the training room at Harvard and asked for an extra. Had a few connections, so you know I don't want to get anyone in trouble. But I managed to get myself another X-ray, and the gentleman who looked at my X-ray eight days post break said, "Well, you probably." And we actually have those X-rays, Steve, somewhere. Uh, that gentleman who was an expert in looking at fractures said, "Well, you you you, you probably at one point broke your rib." I can see, but not eight days ago. For me, that was my, that was my wow moment. Um, I have another one that uh, Stephen wants me to share, but that's when I really said there's something here. And at the same time, I started going into the, we, so I was, I kept doing it. I healed very quickly. I say within two weeks, the pain was totally gone. Yeah. Um, and then you had another, uh, you were coaching your kids uh, one day, early morning, and the uh, pool was locked. So you decided to jump the fence or jump the wall and you did something, which was your second very big aha moment. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was a huge believer uh, already. So this was in uh, January of 2018. No, sorry. It's tw 20 January of 2019. So only... Okay. I don't hear the me. foolish thing of being landed on heel. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go um, ahead. And fractured my my fractured my calcaneus bone, which is the heel bone. Um, one of our, you know, very fortunate. We have a, a very knowledgeable podiatrist who, I don't know if if Doctor if Doctor Lyle is on here, but uh, apparently it's a very there's a, a a lot of vasculature around that bone, so. Um, it can heal quickly, but I, again, 
used cuts. I, I, I was given a boot and crutches and uh, I said, okay, great. And walked out of the, the, the urgent care with that and just went straight to doing katsu cycles and was walking, jogging, probably within, I'd say within 10 days, I was out of the boot, right, Steve? I, I have it written yeah. down. And uh, I, I, it was, the pain was completely, some people have difficulty for almost a year. Um, I, I haven't, I, I think after one month, it was not even an issue anymore. So yeah. that was my second aha moment, in addition to a million aha moments with my athletes. Yeah. And, and so you had your rib break in a week you were, it was healed in two weeks. You were fine. I remember you uh, cracked your, your heel in the, on your 11th day, you wrote me and you were walking normally. Um, yeah. And, but you've taken all these personal experiences and you utilize Katsu in a variety of ways with water polo players, with swimmers, uh, both club swimmers generally in their high school years to the collegiate swimmers to people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s with your master swim teams. Can you walk us through both your performance side, rehab side, and very importantly, the recovery side, how you get these athletes um, not only prepared, but also prepared for their next race or their next competition? Yeah, wow, that's a... Uh... So just take it one by one athletic performance. Yeah. What do you do there? Uh, so with swimmers, cause that's who I work with mostly. Um, I've been fortunate enough through with, with Steven to be involved with some even professional athletes, NBA, uh, major league baseball. So that's, that's, that's been very exciting for me more of, you know, feeling like a meeting some rock stars, but as far as swimming, which is, you know, really what I do in my passion. Um, I use the Katsu aqua bands uh, in the water. Um, I use it as I tell people, I don't use it for anyone who's a, a swimming coach out there. I don't use it as fins or paddles or, uh, even a parachute, any of the equipment. I, I use it as a, an additional energy system. So a lot of people talk about, you know, you know, the aerobic system, the anaerobic system, uh, lactate tolerance. I use katsu. So it's, I, I, but you know, it, 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 it's um, it's more than that too because it is it is equipment. It's something that you put on. Uh, but what you, I do, Chris, can you yeah. explain the difference between race pace, which a lot of people focus their intervals, their pace time, etc., in workout, and how you use katsu, which you called race pain, and how does that yeah. prepare an athlete for competition? So my simple analogy is in swimming we use a lot of different test sets um uh, you know a, uh, just to simplify it using the distance of 200 yards and and you know we'll use 200 yards we'll swim five 200s um either descending down to a, an, an all-out effort or more of a lactate tolerance where you know number two through five are uh, an all-out we'll test the lactic acid um and we get their time. I believe, I don't believe, I know for a fact as a swimmer and a coach now, this being 31 years, that it's almost impossible to simulate the same physiology in a practice that you would in a meet. There's a lot of other things. I'm sure I could have arguments with people where there's the psychological piece, there's the um, the actual, you know, fact that it's the race day, it's, uh, they're wearing a, a technical suit, but I believe that there are people, you know, incredible athletes that can push themselves, but I don't believe we push ourselves ever as hard as we do in a real race. So for me, with Katsu at practice, the, the Katsu Aqua Bands, we can not only achieve, it's basically like a booster engine at practice, we can push ourselves to that race pain, the pain that you feel at the end of a race in practice where we can't do it without the bands. Got it. Now, he, here's a simple thing if anyone wanted to argue my, my, what I say is I have had at least 20 to 25 swimmers put the bands on for the first time and they have all said the same thing. Wow, that's how I feel at the end of a race. 
verbatim, they say the same thing. So for me, that, that was enough. And when it's now been 25, 20 to 25 people, first time, right? I've had other athletes, it takes a while for them. Oh, wow, I feel that at the end of the race. Whether they're using arms or legs, of course, we never do arms and legs at the same time. Um, so that's kind of my race pain. We're able to achieve the race pain and then I use race pace as a sort of a secondary tool. So my, we, I work just with my athletes on a simple, it's, it's a Chris, Coach Chris modified Borg scale, one to 10. And 10 is, I, I have to stop. And I want them to be in an, I call it an 8.5 to 9.5 race pain. Um, when they're there, then we try to achieve, whether it's 425s at their 100 race pace or 425s at their 200 race pace or for more of my distance swimmers we'll try to do 1625s at race pain and race pace when we do that every swimmer i've worked with progresses not only over the season but very quickly in just a, a few weeks can you give us just two or three examples of the kids uh, you know let's say they started their junior year in high school with the training with you, training with Katsu, and where they are their senior year or beginning of the season versus end of season, just concrete examples of, of kids' improvement. Um, uh, an example is we had one young man at our team. Uh, he uh, actually started using Katsu as sort of a, a uh, not recovery, but more of a rehab for his shoulder. Um, so we started actually using it for him. And then once his shoulder was better, again, just doing simple protocols for, for that, that everyone can get through Steven for, for rehab. We started using the Katsu bands uh, uh, his, his junior year in, in high school. And at first we were working on just slow technique, slow technical swimming with the Katsu bands on because he couldn't push himself because he was out of shape. And... Uh, but he liked the feel. He liked the feel of, oh, I feel like I'm working hard without working hard. Well, little did he know he was working hard. Um, he was at that time, again, I apologize if I'm boring any non-swimmers. At that time, he was swimming just under, just under 50 seconds in, in yards in the 100 butterfly. And just he was just swimming around a 48 low, 47 high, 100 yard freestyle. Fast forward. Uh, to his next year. So about a year later, we were down to, and, and again, the only thing we really changed, again, there's a normal progression with an athlete. Uh, I believe his progression was exponential. Um, we, we started using Katsu probably three to four days a week during that year. And he uh, ended up uh, getting recruited to an Ivy school. Um, he went to, he swam at Yale and uh, ended up swimming uh, his senior year, 44 in the 100 free, 47 in the 100 fly. And then, you know, fast forward for his, this, this year, actually, it's, it's sad that he wasn't able to swim the NCAAs, but finished his senior year in college this year, swimming 42 in the 100, 100 free and uh, kind of became more of a 100 freestyler and 19.4 in the 50 free. So incredible improvements and, and used Katsu through his whole career. So, so just to put in perspective, a, a sub 50, a second 100 butterflyer and a 48-ish um, 100 freestyler um, isn't attracting any attention from any university anywhere. Now, put his improvement times to the 48 fly and the 44 freestyle. Now he's getting attention from from college, <laughs> excuse right. me, college coaches. How can you give us like? three or four examples of specifically what did you do with him in a workout with Katsu? In a workout. Um, so again, with him specifically, and we, again, through protocols I've learned from Steven and from Dr. Sato, just a combination of, uh, and swimming specifically, right, Steve? Um, you know, we would alternate by days, arms and legs. Um, one day we would do arms, one day would we do legs. And I'm still learning. So, you know, I apologize again if I'm not, not as specific as people would like. Uh, an example of when we would do katsu, katsu arms, uh, we would, of course, warm up before the practice with katsu cycles. Then uh, we would swim, I would say, two-thirds of what a, a normal athlete would swim in a practice with getting the aerobic work in. And then we would do our katsu sets. 
uh, specific sets for him were uh, with katsu arms would be, you know, I always do a little bit of warm up with the katsu bands. I call it, you know, the hundred warm up. It's it, with legs and arms. It's the same thing. It's a twenty five. It's a, a twenty with arms on. It's a twenty five build, a twenty five skull, a twenty five strong, a twenty five easy, just to kind of activate the arms. And then we go into our more specific set for this individual swimmer. We would do freestyle sets anywhere between eight to 16 25s at race pain and hopefully race pace. Again, it's a hard thing to, to wrap our brains around when we spent so many years race pace, race pace, race pain. I wanted race pain, race pace. So if, if, if there was race pace, I felt like the bands weren't tight enough. So we, when we got to race pain that, oh, I'm at an eight and a half, I'm at a nine. Okay, now let's hit race pace. So some days he could get 825s in where he's hitting his pace at race pain. Some days he could do, you know, 12 up to 16. Uh, failure is an option. So if he failed, it was okay. It was okay. It just meant, you know, that day, um, and then we were pushing, you know, and we could talk about this as well. There's a whole psychological aspect to it. You know, when, when they can swim 1225s at race pain and race pace, you know that they're getting close to, you know, what, what, what they want to do. And we were, we were working on, on his goal time. So we weren't using his current best time, but we were using his, his goal time for that part of the season. Uh, with legs on, we would do... Um, Again, we would warm up 100 on another day with the legs, 25 build, 25 kick, 25 strong, 25 easy swim, just kind of drag his legs behind him. And then we would do specific stuff. Now, even though he had the legs on and we did some other creative kicking only sets, but on the specific race pain, race, race pace, we would really focus on leg driven freestyle. So swimming freestyle, really using his legs. What kind of... Uh if you don't mind uh, relaying your secrets, coaching secrets, what are these creative kicking sets that you talk about? Oh my God. I mean, the same thing that everyone else is using, you know, we mix it up. We do, you know, we, we would actually, and, and I believe it's a, a very interesting thing to, for people to, I'd love to get people's feedback on it is there's a lot in the swimming world about asking swimmers to do hypoxic or breath hold underwater swimming. It's frowned upon. It's actually, uh, and I don't do it, but what's neat with the katsu bands on is if, if you can find a swimmer who can have the leg bands on and go beyond 12 and a half to 15 meters underwater, they don't have them on tight enough. So we would do a lot of underwater work, but just short bursts of underwater kicking, uh, five to seven underwater dolphin kicks, which would get him to 15 meters and then just pop up easy swim. Not, that's not super creative, but that was something that was very successful. We would do a lot of uh, kicking against a stretch cord with the katsu bands on his legs uh, on a kickboard or without a kickboard in a streamline with a snorkel on. Do you um, practice again, any starts, and starts when you have them yeah, on your legs? Yeah, and, and, and then working on starts, uh, working on plyometric jumps on the deck transitioning to starts with the bands on, um, working on reacting, being explosive, and then always kind of a, the finisher, as you know, someone would say in a lot of other sports, a super set is take the bands off, two or three explosive starts without the bands on. Always the same reaction from every athlete. Wow, I feel like I have a great start. Uh, so, and we, we, we did see with a lot of, all of my athletes who work on that, uh, their starts improve. Their starts, I, I believe they get quicker, but I feel like their starts become more athletic. That's That would be how I describe it. They have a more athletic start. Not just doing it once, but doing it, integrating it into your into your program. Yeah. And then um, we had a coach who just uh, had a question that he could see practicing your starts and your breakouts too at race pace just from let's say half the way. And I, I recall that you actually practiced your kids in, in sort of the 15 yard or 12 yard section of the pool. Can yeah, you, yeah, we, can you, yeah, we, exactly. We use the diving wall a lot. Um, and again, just working on with both either arms on or legs on 
you know, an explosive athletic push off and, and the breakout. Um, and I really think it helps them. You see a lot of high school swimmers that, you know, they're, they're losing their races from flags to wall, wall to flags. And what are the coaches doing? You know, work that part, work that part. I believe that Katsu automatically teaches them to be more athletic because they're dealing with that race pain. Um, so, you know, they certainly build strength. They certainly build muscle. I see a lot of people on here who could be more technical about describing that, the actual physiological part. But yes, so using the, the diving well to, to work on the explosive part of the, the underwater transitioning to the breakout and those first few strokes to get into your, whatever your stroke rhythm is. Yeah. And Does then that answer it, Steve. Yes, Sorry. very, very well. Now you, you're known from what I understand as a sprint coach. However, however, you also have had great, great success. You have some athletes at, at Stanford who are distance swimmers and, and others and you've been training them very innovatively, distance swimmers with the bands on. Can you explain how you do that? Yeah, so for, for the distance swimmers, um, again, this is, it's actually, I've been coaching sprint, uh, yeah, I've been, I've actually been labeled as a sprint coach, but I, I feel like my, my specialty is breaststroke and distance swimming, so I don't know. Um, so for distance swimming and, um, you know, I was really fortunate even way back in the years of Switzerland working with uh, a young woman named Swan Oberson, who was a, uh, she was sixth in Beijing. Uh, we weren't using Katsu, of course, but um, so always sort of been exposed to what it takes to be a, a distance swimmer. And really for them, you know, it's about how, how long can they endure pain? You know, that we, we label in the swimming world, we kind of label them as being a little bit crazy, right? Especially those that do. And I think that, that that's exactly it. I've fortunately had a few athletes who can take the psychological part of, of swimming with katsu bands on. Um, again, speaking only of swimming with the katsu aqua bands on. So again, not super creative and not really a secret, but what we'll do and what I did with, specifically with this swimmer who is a, you know, he's a, a 418, 500 yard freestyler. Um, race pain, race pace. Now with him, we'll do more, 50s rather than 25s at race pace um, again it's just something that I don't know if it's right or wrong uh, it's been working and worked with other athletes as well so I would say that with him and with other distance swimmers I work with we we tend to have the bands on a little a little bit lighter if I use my uh, you know give my modified Borg scale maybe like a seven and a half or eight and a half so that they can swim 1250s, 1650s, 2050s at race pain, race pace. And I've seen it done and just been blown away at how tough these kids are to, to do that. So I, I believe the pace work for the distance swimming is more important than with the sprinters. Those sprinters have so much lactic acid when they're using the bands correctly that uh, I know when you see the, the, the katsu color that, that we talk about a lot, I know that they're improving yeah now we've talked about the um how you work with sprinters and now how you work with uh, distance swimmers we're in this unique period in our time when nobody has access to a pool and the only pools that some people have access to is a backyard pool and you've actually even in this scenario you've been you've taking your creativity taking the cuts bands and adapted it to backyard pools. Can you yep. fill us in on that program? Yeah, so, um, well, again, because you know, we, we also uh, can talk about how we're using Katsu, the, the pneumatic belts, but specifically with the Katsu Aqua Bands, which are pneumatic as well, because there's the, the, the hybrid neoprene. Um, I have an athlete who's actually not stuck down in Florida, but he and his family, uh, right when the, the COVID-19 pandemic really started to, to take, you know, take, take its hands on the entire world. They decided to stay down in Florida because they had access to an Olympic sized pool down there. They flew down there and within three days that pool got shut down. Fortunately, in their backyard of their summer home, they have a, probably a, I'd call it a, maybe a, a 10 meter, maybe a pool. 
Um, but they have a lot of uh, toys down there with them. And the two things they have are the katsu bands and a stretch cord. So they've tied the stretch cord. And, and we've seen a lot of images of this on, on TV, anyone who's following the swimming world right now. Um, but the nice thing with the, this particular athlete, and I have some other athletes who are integrating it as well, is, you know, using the katsu bands in, in a new, where you're basically in, in, in a bucket of water, right? So putting the leg belts on, uh, the leg bands kicking against the wall, um, putting the arm belts on, doing sculling in place, putting either the arms or legs on, attaching to the stretch cord, the stretch cord is attached to a ladder, doing super slow swimming in place, working on technical swimming, which is something we could talk about another time, because I believe that's a whole new, uh, a whole new thing to investigate is neuromuscular pathways with katsu on. Uh, but yeah, just jumps, vertical jumps, vertical kicking in a backyard pool. The reason why I believe the katsu bands take it to the next level is for the exact thing we've been talking about. You're able to get a workout in and mo hopefully a lot of us understand the physiology of katsu, but if you're in your backyard pool playing around and you know, this young athlete I'm talking about is a 15 year old young, young man, he puts the bands on, he's getting a much better workout, uh, more difficult and, um, <laughs> If you think of kind of a katsu slogan, it's really anywhere, anytime, anyone, and he's doing it in a backyard pool in Florida. And he is probably getting ahead of a lot of his teammates, because um, unfortunately I don't have access to a backyard pool with all of them, but he's getting ahead because uh, he's doing katsu every day, probably more than he would be up here. Yeah. If anybody would like um, examples of Chris's um, backyard pool workouts. Um, they're very specific. He goes through very specific drills and sets. Uh, we'll post those on our um, uh, blog, which I'll put in the, uh, the chat room here. Um, we have another very successful coach um, from Southern California, and she asks, uh, what interv intervals are you having these sprinters and distance swimmers do their stuff? And please put it in context because you're talking about a 44 yard freestyle uh, swimmer he's obviously swimming at a at a faster pace than the younger kids right or not yeah yeah no i mean they are hitting race pace i'm, I'm using you know it depends on the athlete but i'm using i'm using real pretty tight intervals for 25s um freestyle i'm using 20 or 25 second interval for backstroke and butterfly, I'm using 25 to 35 second interval. And for breaststroke, I'm using 30 to 35 second interval. Again, it is specific and it's a lot of trial and error and I'm pretty old school where it's just all in a notebook. Um, with 50s, you know, freestyle again specifically using 45 to 50 second intervals and the, the other strokes, uh, you know, back in butterfly 50 to 55 seconds and breaststroke breaststroke is interesting because uh, breaststroke is the slowest stroke but uh, I feel like breaststrokers are really tough um, that's my opinion I don't have any scientific backing on it so some of my top breaststrokers are um, you know they're swimming 56 seconds in 100 yard breaststroke uh, for, for males for females you know between 105 and 110 uh, so I'll have them, those athletes go on, on, on a minute interval for, for breaststroke. But it's, it's, it's very similar to what we would as coaches do in classic swimming. Um, again, I mean, I I'm, I'm, I'm lo would love feedback too on if people feel, but I've also done, you know, all out uh, katsu sprints on a much larger interval or with more rest, 45 seconds. The interesting thing, and some of you coaches out there would probably agree is, when you see the athlete on the wall after six or eight 25s of, of katsu work, they actually, the worst, the, the, and, and please, I'm, I'm saying worst, the, the best part as the coach watching them suffer, but the worst part as an athlete is the rest. As I, I, you can see the lactic acid build up distal to the band. So in their legs, when they have leg belts or in their arms, and they have a lot, they're like, can we go? Can we go? You know, there's a lot of, uh, so that's the whole psychological part too. Sitting on the wall, you know, you see their faces and they're, yeah, 
and their heart rate is elevated and they're huffing, puffing more than, than, than usual. Um, yeah. So yeah, sorry, a lot of, I went on some tangents. No problem. And then you also coach some collegiate water polo players. Yeah. And these are some, some special athletes. Uh, they're MIT, uh, which means that by school rules, by NCAA rules also, they're limited in the amount of hours that they can train relative to their competitors at uh, UCLA or USC or, or even Harvard and Princeton. So how do you right. use Katsu for athletes who have a very limited amount of time? and some of the work that you do to improve their egg beater or swimming speed or stamina? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as funny as this whole, and I apologize for any boring parts of my story, as passionate I am as, of swimming and katsu, my, my, uh, my real passion is actually water polo. I played water polo in high school, I played one year in college, and it's, it's, it's actually my favorite sport uh, to participate and, and swim. So I've, in my third year as the volunteer assistant coach at MIT with the men's program. Uh, and yeah, they, they, these are the smart of the smart. Um, you know, I always joke and, and don't want to go off on any more tangents, but usually when you watch a bunch of college guys, uh, you know, in, in a water polo practice, uh, you know, Steven can attest to this as he's a water polo player as well. You know, they're, they're, we, we warm up by uh, passing the ball, dribbling or passing the ball you know, we'll dribble first and then we'll do some passing just to warm up the shoulder. And usually you'd hear a bunch of college men talking about either the party they went to or, you know, the cute girl or, or whatever. These guys are talking about robots. They really are. It's, it's incredible. And they're constantly asking me questions that usually I have to ask Steve because I can't answer them, but they're incredibly well thought. Um, but it's also been a blessing for us because they actually understand katsu right away. They understand the physiology. They understand the biomechanics. And, you know, and they're also water polo players. So they like pain. They like, you know, they're, they like to, you know, when we have them do dry land with, you know, push-ups. And when they fail at, at 10, they're so frustrated. So how do we use it? Uh, we use it similar to how I use it in swimming. But a lot of sprint, a lot of fast, quick stuff. Um, we do do a lot of egg beater. We do a lot of wall kicking uh, and um, we'll do arms one day. We'll do legs the next day. And what's nice is also for the current head coach um, at MIT this year, he's been really pleased with it is we can get a lot of swimming in a lot of hard work in a short amount of time. So we can have more time with uh, scrimmaging and ball work because the, the, the biggest, the biggest, uh, sort of problem at MIT for all of the athletes is time. They don't have enough time. They have a, a, an incredible amount of academic work. And in water polo, you know, you don't want to spend all the time swimming and especially they don't like to swim. So these guys love it because in a short amount of time, they feel like they get a killer swim practice in. And we've all, the guidance of Steve, we're doing a lot of technical work with passing with the armbands on, shooting with the armbands on and kind of added a new dimension. We call it the fourth dimension uh, for their training of adding the katsu bands on to these other aspects of water polo training. Um, so anyone who is a water polo player out there, I highly recommend either through Steven or, you know, some of the other programs that are using it. It's, I, I believe it's, it's, it is a secret to the water polo world. I really do. Yeah. And then very much like your swimmer. So swimmers, when they go to a big competition, They'll have the preliminary heats in the morning and then the finals in the evening, and maybe it's a two, three, four day meet. And in water polo players, they might have the MIT might go to a college tournament and they may have two, sometimes three games in a day. And you utilize katsu for recovery, both in the swimming world and the water polo world. And can you explain how you do that? Yeah, absolutely. We use it all the time. Uh, they have, you know, it starts off with usually in, in full disclosure and honest, you know, the, all the athletes I work with know that I am passionate and, and very involved with using katsu. So th they'll use it because initially they think, oh, well, if Chris said we should do it, we should do it. Uh, but what happens and you see it quickly is <laughs> my, my problem is I usually don't have enough machine uh, katsu, you know, cycle 2.0s or nanos, which was the predecessor to the cycle 
Um, and so <laughs> sometimes they're sort of fighting over it uh, in, in, in a good way, not, not fighting, but uh, you know, there's a lot of priorities. So they, um, I found swimmers, um, it's kind of 50-50 on whether they like to recover their arms or their legs. If we have time, they like to do both. But it's very interesting. I found that swimmers that are more leg-based swimmers, and, and again, that's kind of a technical swimming term, you know, swimmers that really their swimming is based off their legs. They kick a lot. They like to recover their legs. Swimmers that like to do their arms, you know, do their arms. The water polo players, I felt like uh, it's been more, you know, recovering with their legs because they use their legs so much. I, I don't, I think both are great. Uh, but th that's how we do it. We'll, we'll do three or four cycles, you know, f five minutes of, of cycling on each athlete, next athlete. So in the water polo at tournaments, it's been phenomenal. And they'll try it first. And then, you know, the next tournament, the coach Chris, I, I need to use Katsu. It helps me recover faster. I've just seen it. And it, it you know, it's the, the proof is in the pudding, right? The, they, they feel like they recover faster. Um, we're, we're fortunate enough to have one very well-known swimmer, Michael Andrew, who uses Katsu in his recovery and has even used it at, you know, championship events where he doesn't even have time to go in the warm down pool because either it's too crowded or it just takes too much time. Uses the Katsu three minutes cycle right back into the next event. Yeah. We have a few more minutes, uh, Chris. Could you, if some coach, some athlete, some parent wants to get uh, involved or try Katsu Aqua, what would you recommend? Um, if you live in Boston, come see me. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I think through Stephen or, you know, you can throw my email out to anyone. I think it's more, you know, trying it, finding out where there's somebody near, near, near them where they can try it. And, uh, yeah, I, th that would be, you, you know, you have to try it to, to understand it. So trying it first, feeling it. And, and I, I recommend most coaches to, you got to feel it first. It's very important that you, that you know how it feels. Um, and then if, you know, coaches are willing, if, even if they don't have a swimming background, getting in a pool and trying the, the katsu, trying katsu aqua, trying to just move with it, not just using the cycles, but actually moving with it and experiencing this, Katsu pain, this race pain. It's, it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's almost an addictive pain, you know, it's, uh, they, 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 they like it. They get addicted to it they, because they know they're pushing themselves. They, they really like it. So th that wasn't probably a very good answer to that question, Stephen, but that's, um, what I would say. You got to try it. You got to try it. Got it. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I am going to share your, I shared your email with uh, everybody and, and there have been uh, several questions here that we didn't get to, but um, I'm sure coaches will reach out to you and then and yeah, I'll no make problem. the introduction. So thank you very much, Chris. It has been a, a great hour and uh, good luck with your rest of the season. All right. Thank you, Chris. I lost you. Yes. No problem. Thank you, Chris. I'm back. Okay. Yes. All right. Take care. Bye.